I'm going to read uh, chapter one of Dussel, and it is entitled Transmodernity and Interculturality and Interpretation from the Perspective of Philosophy of Liberation. And we'll start here with the first subsection, subsection one, in search of self-identity from, from Eurocentrism to developmentalist coloniality. Okay, so let me share my screen. And just like I did with the Communist Manifesto, I'll, I'll read through here um, and then uh, give some commentary and give suggestions for the final essay. Okay, in search of self-identity from Eurocentrism to developmentalist coloniality. I belong to a generation of Latin Americans whose intellectual beginnings are situated in the 1950s, after the end of the Second World War. For us, in the Argentina of that era, there was no doubt that we were a part of Western culture. For that reason, some of our subsequent categorical judgments are a natural expression of someone who opposes himself. The philosophy that we studied set out from the Greeks in whom we saw our most remote lineage. The Amerindian world had no presence in our studies, and none of our professors would have been able to articulate the origin of philosophy with reference to indigenous peoples. Moreover, the ideal philosopher was one who was familiar with the precise details of classical Western philosophers and their contemporary developments. There existed no possibility whatever for a specifically Latin American philosophy. It is di difficult to evoke in the present the firm hold that the European model of philosophy had on us, since at that moment in Argentina, there was still no reference to the United States. Germany and France had complete hegemony, especially in South America, although this was not the case in Mexico, Central America, or the, His uh, or the Hispanic, French, or British Caribbean. In cultural philosophy, there was reference to Oswald Spenger, Arnold Toynbee, Alfred Weber, A.L. Kroeber, Ortega y Gasset, or F. Braudel, and later William McNeil. But this was always in order to comprehend the Greek phenomenon with celebrated works such as Paideia or uh, W. Jaeger's Aristotle. The debate about the Middle Ages, since the revaloration authorized by Etienne Guilson, and the understanding of Western, that is European, culture as the context in which to comprehend modern and contemporary philosophy. Aristotle, Aquinas, Descartes, Kant, Heidegger, and Scheller were the key figures. And, and in my historical surveys, I cover most of these guys, not Heidegger, Heidegger's 20th century, and Scheller's uh, newer uh, as well. This was a substantialist view of culture without fissures and, and chronological from east to west as required by the Hegelian view of universal history. Hegel saw history as progressing and getting better and better. He also saw it as moving from the east, from China, uh, westward, and so we're going west, and then the phenomenon of the United States only reinforces that because you move from Western Europe across the Atlantic into North America. Um, so this east to west movement uh, is something that was just ingrained in this Eurocentric sort of perspective. With my trip to Europe, in my case crossing the Atlantic by boat in 1957, we discovered ourselves to be Latin Americans, or at least no longer Europeans. From the moment that we disembarked in Lisbon or Barcelona, the, difference were, the differences were obvious and could not be concealed, consequently the problem of culture humanistically, philosophically, and existentially was an obsession for me. Who are we culturally? What is our historical identity? This was not a question 
of the possibility of describing this identity objectively, it was something prior. It was the existential anguish of knowing oneself and for the first time realizing, oh, I'm Latin American, I'm not European. In Spain, as well as Israel, where I was from, uh, where I was from 1957 to 1961, always in search of an answer to the question of what it is to be Latin American. My studies steered me towards challenging this mode of questioning, but the theoretical mode of culture would inevitably continue to be the same for many years still. The impact of Paul Ricoeur's classes, which I attended at the Sorbonne uh, in Paris, and his off-sided article, Universal Civilization and National Culture, responded to the substantialist model, which was moreover essentially Eurocentric. Although civilization still did not have the Spanglerian connotation of a moment of cultural decadence, denoting instead the universal technical structures of human instrumental progress as a whole, whose principal actor during the recent centuries had been the West, Culture, nonetheless, constituted the valorative, mythical context of a nation or a group of nations like Latin America. This was the first model that we used during those years in order to situate Latin America. Okay, so he's saying that he's very much indebted to Paul Ricoeur, uh, who he studied with. And OK, civilization is not really what he was looking for, but Ricoeur made this distinction between civilization and culture. And culture was a, a concept that could be used to describe Latin America. It was from this culturalist perspective that I began my first studies of Latin America, hoping to discover the place of the latter in universal history, a la Toynbee, and discerning new depths inspired primarily by Paul Ricoeur, as previously mentioned, but also by Max Weber, uh, Pitram, Sorokin, uh, K. Jaspers, W. Sobart, etc. We organized a Latin American week in December of 1964 with Latin American students that were studying ver in various European countries. It was a foundational experience. Hoysu de Castro, German Arciniegas, uh, Francois Hutar, and many other intellectuals, including P. Ricoeur, articulated their perspectives on the matter. The theme was achieving awareness, prise de conscience, of the existence of Latin American culture, conceiving of the existence of Latin American culture, because nobody had thought to actually articulate that before. Rafael Brown Menendez and Natalie Botana disagreed with the existence of such a concept. They argued that Latin, that uh, Latin American culture didn't even exist. This is in 1964. In the same year, I was in the process of publishing an article in the journal Ortega y Gasset in Madrid, which contested the historicist reduction of our Latin American reality. Against the revolutionary who struggles for the future beginning of history, against the liberal who mystifies early 19th century national emancipation from Spain, against the conservatives who for their part mythologize the splendor of the colonial era, against the indigenistas who negate everything that followed the great American Indian cultures, I propose the need to reconstruct in its integrity and within the framework of world history, the historical identity of Latin America. Okay, this word reconstruct is important. Okay, we don't have all the sources, uh, especially not readily available from Euro the Eurocentric perspective to piece together the history of Latin American culture, but this became a project for Dussel to reconstruct the history and the existence and the being of Latin American culture. In the face of people who said that Latin American culture didn't even exist, okay, because it didn't constitute a culture. These philosophical works corresponded to a period of historical empirical research from 1963 onward that paralleled through funding that I was awarded in Maguncia over various years, the thesis of my Hispano-American history that I defended at the Sorbonne uh, 
in 1967. Okay. A course in the history of culture at the Universidad de Noreste uh, Residencia Chaco, Argentina, gave me the opportunity to survey the panoramic of world history in the manner of Hegel or Toynbee, in the, in the context of which I sought to situate, locate, find the location of Latin America through a reconstruction, a Heideggerian destruction. Uh, Heidegger was very fond of making up words uh, and giving them unique definitions. Um, uh, but destruction would be like a deconstruction of later uh, 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 Derrida in France and, and deconstructionism. Heidegger is, you know, kind of a prototype for that kind of stuff. The product of that course, Hypothesis for the Study of Latin America Within World History, attempted to elaborate a history of cultures that sets out from their perspective uh, respective ethical mythical nuclei. Oh, and this ethical mythical nuclei is uh, something from Ricoeur. He mentioned it earlier, and I, I didn't emphasize that, but but he's very influenced by Ricoeur because he studied with him, and this ethical uh, ethical mythical nuclei um, are very important. Uh, as an early inspiration for Dussel. In order to engage in an intercultural dialogue, it was necessary to begin by conducting an analysis of the most remote contents of their mythical narratives, of the supposed ontologies and the ethical political structure underlying each of the cultures in question. There's a tendency to quickly theorize such a dialogue without a concrete understanding of the possible themes of such a dialogue. For that reason, uh, that course of 1966, with an extensive methodological introduction and with a minimal description of the great cultures, taking into account criticizing and integrating the visions of Hegel uh, in Daniel Levinsky, uh, W. Dilthey, O. Spangler, Alfred Weber, K. Jaspers, A. Toynbee, uh, Teilhard de Chardin, and many others, and with reference to the most important contemporary world histories, allowed me to situate Latin America, as mentioned, within the process of human development since the origins of the Homo species, Homo sapiens, through a Paleolithic uh, through the Paleolithic and Neolithic ages and up to the time of the West invasion of America. From Mesopotamia and Egypt to India and China and across the Pacific, one finds great Neolithic American cultures, a source of Latin American proto-history. The confrontation between sedentary agricultural communities and the Indo-European of the Euro-Asiatic steppes, among them the Greeks and Romans, and between these latter and the Semites, mostly from uh, the Arabian desert, provided me a key to the history of this ethical mythical nucleus, which had passed through the Byzantine and Muslim worlds, arriving at the Romanized Iberian Peninsula to uh, the other source of our Latin American proto-history. Okay, and I, I sort of sketched out the, some of this history, especially as it, it penetrates into Europe uh, in earlier lectures. Um, this uh, Paleolithic and Neolithic um, notion of history, um, you know, at the time that Dussel was working on this, uh, the, the research hadn't fully developed in terms of uh, anthropology and archaeology to bring all the evidence together. I mean, there were big strides, uh, but a lot of misconceptions within uh, the disciplines of archaeology and anthropology. And there is a new work by David Graeber and David uh, Congro, I think. Um, but I'll, I'll look it up and, and um, mention it. But uh, Or maybe I can just look it up right now. Let's not. Get confused here, um, but uh, it's relatively new. Uh, 
it's called the dawn of everything. Let me. Look here and see. So here is uh, let's see if this is Wingro, David Wingro. Um, but uh, they do a full analysis of this very early. Uh, history of humanity and use a lot of comparative sources, especially during the time this modern period, uh, as um, Europeans from a Eurocentric uh, modern philosophical perspective of the Enlightenment, uh, then encountered especially indigenous people within the Americas. They do a lot of work in in, in using those examples that are well documented to develop a theory of early human society um, that is a lot more factually based and is um, radically contrary to the kind of simple minded notions of primitive society that we usually fall into. And even myself, when I was doing like the, the schematic introduction to Marxist political ecology, uh, you know, just by habit, I fall into uh, these simplistic ways of, of talking and thinking about primitive cultures and like primitive production and all that. Um, this book goes a long way to correcting those errors. Uh, so I, I really recommend this um, to you. Uh, and, and we see how this fits in with the way that Ducell is thinking and that, you know, this is, you know, something that's very valuable about what Ducell is doing is that he's taking this very long durée notion of history and trying to trace the history of Latin America all the way back to the Stone Age. Uh, which I think is very valuable, especially as we, especially as we are confronting the ecological cataclysm, this kind of even this really great long durée history of humanity is very important because as we move into this ecological cataclysm of 2021, um, we're heading into a new geological period. Uh, the geological period that we live in right now, from our perspective uh, within it, we call the Holocene. Um, and it's lasted for about 10,000 years. And this is a climate in which agriculture is able, is, is easy, let's say. Um, uh, but we're going to move out of that. So it's very important to think about the history of humans that existed before the Holocene. That's going into the Paleolithic and the Neolithic, uh, going backwards from the Neolithic, then backwards to the, the Paleolithic. Um, and there is evidence for the way that these societies existed and Graver, Graver and Wingrove do a good job at showing, uh, you know, they don't reduce these primitive cultures to just one model, but they show that there's a lot of variability and that as we move into this other phase of human existence, uh, going through the ecological cataclysm, you know, there are lots, there's lots of uh, cultural resources for structuring society in different ways that respond to that, that crisis and, and new conditions, new geological conditions, new, new ecological conditions. Um, so I really recommend that book. And it fits in here uh, with Dussel's sort of frame of mind. <clears throat> Okay, so in March of 1967, returning to Latin America, when the ship passed through Barcelona, the editor of Nova Terra handed, hand delivered to me my first book, Hipotetis uh, para una historia de la Iglesia en Americana Latina, the hypothesis regarding the history of the church in Latin America. In this work, one could see at the religious level, the basic contours of a philosophy of culture for our continent. This small work would make history because it offered the first 
reinterpretation of religious history within the context of a global cultural history. In the historiographic tradition, the question was formulated as follows. What were the relations between church and state? Uh, now, on the other hand, it was defined in terms of the cultural clash and the position of the church. And this cultural class is, is uh, out of Toynbee and others. Um, the crisis of emancipation from Spain enthroned until 1810 was described as the passage from a model of Christendom to that of a pluralist and secular society. In this work, we can already see a new cultural history of Latin America, not only of the church, which was no longer Eurocentric, but still developmentalist, like when Gutierrez talks of on, on development and Che Guevara on development, um, no longer Eurocentric, but still thinking within Western terms. This is why when I gave the speech, culture of Latin America, uh, Latin American culture and national culture at the conference at the Universidad del Nordeste in May, uh, on May 25th of 1967, it was like a manifesto, a generational take of consciousness. Rereading it, I find sketched out many issues that in one way or another would be modified or expanded over the next 30 years or more. Okay, so this is really what he sees as his uh, groundbreaking manifesto. In September that same year, I began giving semester-long courses in an institute based in uh, Quito, Ecuador, where I was able to posit the full breadth of this new reconstructive vision of the history of Latin American culture in the presence of over 80 participants from almost every Latin American country, including the Caribbean and Amer uh, American Latinos. The impression that I caused in the audience was immense and profound, disquieting for some, and in the end, inspiring in all the hope for a new interpretive era. In a course given in Buenos Aires in 1969, I began with Towards the Philosophy of Culture, a question which culminated with a section entitled The Achievement of Latin American Consciousness, which was perceived as the cry of a generation. Okay, so uh, he's talking about Latin America coming to self-consciousness as a culture, okay, not as a political class, but as a culture. So there's something similar to the Communist Manifesto and the proletariat becoming self-conscious. He's taking that same sort of thinking, which comes out of Hegel with you know, the self-consciousness of history unfolding, et cetera, but it's more concrete and historical. But now the Latin America situated in world history uh, can conceive of itself as its own culture in itself being a real existing thing and for itself being a self-conscious actor in the world, not relying on North America or Europe to save them in this developmentalist sort of way, but for Latin America to be a self-conscious and uh, a self-conscious culture that has agency of its own, that can act on its own as a culture, and it doesn't need somebody to save it. <clears throat> Any quotes from this? It is commonplace now to say that our cultural past is heterogeneous and at times incoherent, hybrid, and even in a certain way marginal in comparison to European culture. But what is most tragic is when the very existence of such a culture is ignored. Since what is relevant is that, at any rate, there exists a culture in Latin America. Although some may deny it, its originality is evident in art, in the style of life. Okay. So Latin American culture exists. It's like, that's what he's, it's like even fighting for the mere existence and the idea that European uh, Eurocentric view of the world could just ignore Latin America, like it just didn't exist. Uh, he's fighting against. And, um, and this is gonna become a big part of 
his analysis here for this transmodernity. As a professor in the National University of Quillo, uh, Mendoza, Argentina, I left, let flow this very same historical reconstruction and did so in a strictly philosophical way. This took the form of an anthropological trilogy in questions such as the conceptualization of the body soul and the immortality of the soul or the spirit flesh, person, resurrection, etc. Always bearing in mind the questions of the origins of Latin American culture. These works were published as El Humanismo Hellenico, Hellenic Humanism, and El Dualismo in la Antropologia de la Cristiana, Cristiandad, <laughs> Dualism in the Anthropology of Christianity. This final work concluded in the course of 1966, which had only covered up to, uh, to fifth century Latin Germanic Christianity by dealing with Europe's relationship with an expansion into Latin America. I reconstructed anew the history of different Christianities, uh, Armenian, Georgian, Byzantine, Coptic, Latin, Germanic, etc., as well as describing in other later works the clash of the Islamic world with Spain between 711 and 1492 which I, I did a historical survey of that in earlier lectures. The obsession was not to leave aside any century without being able to integrate it into a view of world history which would allow us to understand the origin, development, and content of Latin American culture. Both existential demands and all still Eurocentric philosophy led us to search for a cultural identity. But it was there that a rupture began to appear. Okay. 